phone, video conferencing, members of the public will have an opportunity to provide comments at the end. And this meeting is being recorded. Uh, so first agenda item uh, is the approval of the minutes of April 28th, 2021. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes? I'll make that motion. Thank you. Is there a second? I second. second. Thank you. All those in favor? All those Aye. opposed? Aye. Thank you. So approved. All right. Uh, I'm going to ask the executive director if he has any comments this, this afternoon. Uh, sure. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, and good afternoon, commissioners and, and members of the public and our guests. Uh, I am Evandro Carvalho. I have the privilege of being the executive director of the Boston Human Rights Commission. Uh, excited today for another public meeting and public hearing. Uh, obviously, we're going to focus on the issue of digital divide. We have the providers of the service here to talk to us today. Uh, but I'll take 30 seconds to just update you on a few things that are going on uh, that you should be aware of. Uh, first and foremost, our website uh, has been revamped and is live uh, on on, uh, on City of Boston website. People can go to boston.gov slash Boston Human Rights Commission uh, to find uh, our website uh, with more updates. Uh, the website uh, obviously has our pictures, has more information about the commission, and in fact has an intake form there to help us start to, you know, get information from people about incidents uh, and or complaints that they may have of discrimination uh, in their communities. Uh, the other thing I wanna flag for you all is, is that uh, I went before the city council a couple of days ago uh, to go justify essentially on their public hearing on budget, it's budget season as you know. Uh, and one thing to, to let you know is that the, the commission has been uh, at least on the side of the mayor's office, they increased our budget by $100,000, which essentially the budget really, the way that I've learned about it is, this, excuse me, this new $100,000 is supposed to help us, you know, hopefully do some, you know, anti-hate issue uh, campaign, uh, particularly in the space, for instance, as you know, uh, I talked about briefly about this last time is the, the increase of incidents against uh, Asian Americans the Pacific Island is both in the city of Boston and throughout the country. Uh, so Mayor Kim Janey and obviously the leadership in the city of Boston are concerned about that. Uh, so they've given us some money to do some work in that space. And uh, as I mentioned, we are part of a large initiative within City Hall that's been trying to figure out ways to support the AAPI community in the city of Boston. And one of the things that, uh, you know, I'll send it to you uh, as a follow up is we created this is a uh, anti, excuse me, a anonymous report incident that hopefully will go on our website, uh, which will help us collect information about hate incidents, obviously not only in the AAPI community, but throughout the city of Boston. Another thing in that space briefly I'll mention is that uh, along the initiatives, a, a perhaps a meeting with Mayor Kim Janey with internal city hall employees to talk about how they are feeling in this space now and hopefully offer them some support. Actually, uh, this is not a, a tentative. This is confirmed it's happening on Tuesday. Uh, again, this is an effort that's been led by us, uh, as well as the human, uh, not human rights, uh, immigrant advancement, uh, a, a, the, the Office of Race and Resiliency, uh, LCA, which, which is a language access office, and many other offices in the city of Boston. Finally, I mentioned also that we've gotten into space of uh, LGBTQ and transgender right, uh, rights in the city of Boston and what we can do to support them. And particularly, as you know, this is one of the other issues that we chose to work on. And I'm sure you can hear my, you can hear my kids uh, uh, down, downstairs, so I apologize if the, you could hear that. But the, essentially prompted by the, the killing of a transgender activist, Johara DeHalto, who unfortunately was killed by a double homicide stab in the city uh, in Dorchester not too long ago, many city departments, including, including us as in the HRC Human Rights Commission, got gotten together recently to figure out what the city can do uh, to better support the transgender community in the city of Boston. And we're perhaps making uh, a, an event next month, which is essentially a listening session, which I'll be part of along with uh, you know the, the trauma team, the women's advancement team. In fact, our new chief of 
equity and inclusion, inclusion, Selena Barrows Miller is also involved in this effort. So I just wanted to flag that as another important matter that we're working on um, and happy to, you know, to discuss further, uh, hopefully perhaps next month or I'll send some information uh, via email. Those are the key things that I want to update the commissioners today, Madam Chair. Okay, well, the budget is something uh, uh, that the, obviously the commission and the commissioners would like to see. It's something we should approve. So something you probably wanna to bring to our next meeting uh, uh, or actually in advance. So the first one, obviously we weren't involved because we were in existence, but now we are. So it's something we'd be interested in. And the other thing I would, I just want to update the commissioners. We did send a letter to the mayor. As you know, we approved the last time. And I think people did see uh, in the press that the mayor uh, has uh, decided not to go forward with continue the suit brought by the 10 black police officers who had uh, filed a suit alleging that the uh, test was discriminatory and then they won in district court and then the city appealed the city has now dropped that appeal which was as you know our recommendation as well uh, so i was pleased to see that uh, i know a number of people were uh, concerned about the appeal so i was very pleased to see that the mayor did that and and i think it was absolutely the right thing on her part and it had been around for 10 years the city had been on the wrong side of that suit. So the city has now come on the right side of that suit. And uh, for all the reasons, one being it's the right thing to do, two being the city is saving a lot of money by not doing the wrong thing. So, uh, or creating bad law uh, in the appeals court or heaven forbid in the Supreme Court. So. Uh, I was very pleased to see that the, uh, that the acting mayor uh, did the right thing in this case, which is hard to do after 10 years of doing the wrong thing. So pleased to see that. So uh, we're gonna move on today uh, and uh, uh, spend the rest of the meeting on the issue that we've been talking about for several months, which is a concern about access to broadband in the city of Boston. And if I can do a little history here, um, you know, in 1996, the Congress passed and the president signed the Telecommunications Act. And the vision was to provide flexibility and innovation which replaced the sort of heavy handed regulation of the internet. Because the internet in 1996 was not what it is today. It was not the means of communication. We still had used things called telephones and they were connected to the wall, if you remember in 1996. Uh, kids today, when they see something connected to the wall, they don't even know what it is, or they see you know, buttons that you push. So, but in 1996, that is how we communicated. So when the Telecommunications Act uh, was passed, uh, we were talking about a very different thing. So we really did do away with heavy handed regulation. And to tell you the truth today, uh, the Telecommunications Act was really dealing a lot with the baby bells and, and, and the telephone. Uh, and it, it uh, replaced, as I said, really heavy handed regulation. And the hope and the vision was to produce competition, lower prices and remove barriers to entry with the hope that there would be a flourishing of internet providers that in the end would produce a lot of innovation and lower prices. And in fact, what it has produced is some of that, but it also has produced a lot of mergers and acquisitions in very, very large providers and whole lanes that have of swaths of the population that have do not have access to high quality internet, which is, which is our concern. And today, unlike in 1996, disparity in internet access creates more disparity in the general population. Because if you don't have internet today, you can't access many, many things. 
And that are all the things we know about. Obvious things like education. It's hard to work in many jobs without it, especially in the last year, if you didn't have internet at home, it was hard to work. It's hard to find a job or apply for a job if you don't have good quality internet. You hear today, we found out that in healthcare, uh, telemedicine has been a major piece, especially in the last year for people to access medicine by telemedicine. We found out in community healthcare, 85% of patients in community healthcare centers, when they talk about telemedicine, they're talking about the telephone. Only 15% of them have the stable kind of internet and quality of internet or internet at all that they can use video for telemedicine. Only 15% of community health patients in the Commonwealth of the 16 community health centers. So in the greater Boston area, uh, you can't file an insurance claim unless you do it over the internet. You can't, you can't apply to college unless you do it over the internet. Um, it's interesting because you can't apply for internet or free or reduced internet easily without the internet. So there's a new, as you know, federal law that's providing uh, reduced costs for internet, $50 a month, but most of it is done over the internet. And if you can't do it over the internet, you can do it through mail, but you wouldn't know about it unless you had the internet. So it's sort of a catch 22 to get reduced internet, you have to have the internet. And so the, and the, the thing I learned about in the last couple of months, which is one of the things I didn't think about at all. And we learned about it because we heard about it at one of these hearings is there are a number of devices that depend on the internet for monitoring health, that health monitoring actually depends on the internet for your own health and also for, in some cases, a device that is monitoring somebody else's health. We heard from somebody who is, was monitoring her father who had Alzheimer's and had a device which depended on the internet that was connected to her father that showed if he left the house, she would know through this device. But when the internet went down, she had to take her two young children and go and check on her father. So there were devices that we hadn't thought of, I think I certainly hadn't thought of, that, uh, that were dependent on the internet for such a range of our daily lives, which in 1996, no one thought of, and therefore no one thought of regulations. We regulate cable, but we don't really regulate the internet. Uh, and uh, we know in Boston, there are 16% of homes that have no access, do not have any access, don't have any subscription uh, to the internet. So um, Susan, you wanna put up the slides for a minute? Or the PowerPoint, I guess I should say, or back in 1996, I said slides. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, John Lewis said, access, sorry. that's all right. John Lewis said access to the internet is the civil rights issue of the 21st century. And I think we've come to believe that listening at our hearings. And here are some of the statistics that we've learned about. As I said, 16% of households lack an internet subscription in Boston. 20% uh, lack a device at all. And here's the statistics about uh, the community health centers and the 16 Massachusetts community health centers. Uh, telehealth visits, 85% are done over telephone. 41% of people covered by Medicare lack an internet connector, computer or smartphone at home. And a recent Pew study found that only 46% of older adults with annual incomes lower than $30,000 go online, but only 27% of low income older adults. We heard from a lot of seniors during these hearings. A lot of seniors showed up and talked about how the internet was a lifeline to their friends as they got older. 
and especially in the last year, to their friends and their family, their children and their grandchildren. And what a, what a loss it was if you did not have it. And we also heard, you know, in Boston, uh, 60, over 60% of low-income seniors live in public housing. And if you want to talk to your family or you want to talk to your doctor, having it in a common room is not enough. You want to have privacy to talk to your children and you want to have privacy to talk to your doctor. You need that in your own home, not in a common room. So 62% uh, of speed tests conducted in the city uh, prove target speeds of 25 megabytes uh, and that target speed is really pretty slow. So we have attached and we will share uh, with uh, Comcast and Verizon and Starry, um, we will definitely share these maps, but what they basically show you is in areas with the majority of black folks, black and brown folks and other people of color, that it's an inverse ratio to high quality internet. Uh, and we have uh, two maps, this one and one that's interactive, which shows you in terms of the lower poverty neighbor, neighborhoods have less uh, quality internet. The high, the high poverty, I mean, high poverty neighborhoods have less quality internet and the low poverty neighborhoods, meaning the wealthier neighborhoods have much better quality internet. So folks in the back bay, have very high quality internet. Folks in Mattapan uh, are on the opposite end of the scale. Uh, and, and that's where we are today. So I wanna introduce, or actually maybe have them introduce themselves. The, we have, uh, and we really do appreciate your being with us today. Folks from Comcast, Instari and Verizon. Uh, if you would join us uh, and uh, introduce yourself, we appreciate your being with us uh, and Madam talking Chair, with us today. Perhaps before we jump into that, uh, some basic housekeeping. As you know, we invited members of the city council to be present with us. I see a few, uh, I see certainly Ed, city council had Flynn here, uh, a, a few staff members, including Carl, Gene, uh, CJ, I should say, from Andrea Campbell's office. Uh, perhaps, actually, I see uh, Jerry Robinson, who's a, a school committee member, I think, is here as well. Uh, perhaps we can invite the city council to say a few words since he's present. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I figured we, we at least give dignitaries a, a quick shout uh, that we have in the I, audience. I, I couldn't, Evandra, I couldn't hear you. What city councilor is here? Uh, Ed, Ed Flynn. Ed Flynn Ed from Flynn. South Boston. And, Ed uh, well, I'll let him, he also represents other areas, but he lives in South Boston. Yeah. He, he represents me. <laughs> yes, he represents you. So perhaps uh, we can elevate him for, for, for 30 seconds. Okay. Councillor Flynn, do you want to say a few words? Yes. Um, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair. It's good to be with you. It's good to be with the executive director and the, and the commissioner, commissioners as well. Uh, thank you for the, this important meeting that you're having today. Uh, we filed a hearing, we had a hearing actually last uh, several months ago on digital equity. Um, and we filed another hearing order again this year because we know it's a critical issue. And as you mentioned, Madam Chair, in your opening comments, um, digital e equity is critical, but we're also seeing so many communities in Boston that don't have um, access to the internet. Uh, many, many, many seniors, many people living in public housing. Um, my, my pop, my constituents in Chinatown um, don't have the access that people do on other areas such as such as Beacon Hill. So what you're talking about tonight is critical. It's critical because we need to educate and make sure the the playing field is level for everybody. And, and certainly not just the wealthy. So I know, um, I know you share that, Madam Chair, and I'm, 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 I'm very thankful for the commissioners that are taking this work so seriously. The Human Rights Commission was established under, under Mayor Flynn in the mid, the mid 80s. So I just wanna say thank you to the commissioners for the incredible work that you're doing and the responsibility you're taking 
In just one brief minute or 30 seconds, I represent the largest Asian community in the city of Boston. I represent the largest residents uh, living in public housing as well, many of them are Asians too. But I wanna say thank you to the commissioners for the work that you're doing and you're going to do on anti-Asian racism. It's real, it's happening in our city, it's happening throughout the country. Um, it's, it's continuing. Many people associated, obviously, with um, COVID-19. Unfairly, it's, it's, it's racist, but our, our seniors in the Asian community are paying a price for the terrible comments and, and attitude of our previous president. Um, so there's a lot of work that we have to do to make sure that our immigrant neighbors are treated with respect and dignity. And I know that's exactly what you are doing here tonight and over the next several months and years. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to the Executive Director and to the Commissioners for giving me a couple minutes to say hello. And, but more importantly, thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you, Councilor Flynn. And, and, and let's continue to work together on this issue. It can use all of us. As you say, it affects everybody's lives and we need to find a solution here. And that's what we're about tonight. So thank you for joining us, appreciate it. And th th thank you, Chair. And thank you to everybody for being here tonight. All right. So uh, we would uh, ask uh, the representatives of the providers, if you would introduce yourselves, we would appreciate it. I wanna start with uh, our friends from Comcast. Good afternoon, my name is Becca Fercasa. I'm the Community Impact Director for Comcast in Greater Boston. Okay. And I am Angela Holm, Director of Government Affairs uh, for Boston. Okay, Verizon. Good evening. Um, my name is Stephanie Lee, and I am the Director of State Government Affairs for New England, um, but located in Boston. And Starry. Hi, Chairwoman McKenna. Good evening. I'm Virginia Lom Abrams, and I head Government Affairs and Strategic Advancement for Starry. Great. So again, thank you for uh, joining us and. Uh, I would be glad if you wanted to uh, make remarks. I also would love you, because we were not able to figure out at all, we tried. Uh, we have no idea, we could not find out, and maybe this is a secret, a, a market secret, but how much of the city each of you uh, serve? In, uh, and we each had our own guess, but we could not find out. Um, we know some of the promises that were made by Verizon when they came here uh, six years ago, I think, when the, uh, but we don't have any idea how much of the city each of you serve. And I know, Starry, you're, you're relatively new to our, our area, but uh, between Comcast and Verizon, Starry, how much of the city do you cover and how much of it do you actually serve? I'm happy to start. Um, so. You know, as you mentioned in 1996 with, with, the, with the Cable Act, that allowed us to start our build early. And we cover just about 100% of the city at this point. And that's, that's gonna be the same infrastructure you're looking at, whether you're at Mattapan or Beacon Hill. Um, once in a while, you will find these pockets where there's no access currently because uh, you know, it wasn't something where we would lay down our cable infrastructure uh, at the time, uh, you know, that, that, that we started building, whether it was a warehouse district or, or something like that. Um, so we're, we're glad to be here, uh, giving back to the community and digital equity is, is what we put our, you know, our life force into with this company. And, and we agree. So what we have is not necessarily the access issue, but the things that surround access and that's adoption. Um, so the infrastructure is there, but the adoption matters, you know, depends on affordability, it depends on access to devices, and it depends on uh, digital literacy skills. And those are the three things that we focus on with our community impact. Um, my colleague, Becca Fracasa, who, who runs that program. And you know, through that, we've, through, through Boston actually, Internet Essentials was a pilot program. Um, it's now a national program and we've connected millions of low-income Americans to the internet through that. It's still $10 a month. We've doubled our speed twice in the last year. So we're up to 50 megabytes per second. Uh, and then this past September, we announced in Boston that we'd be opening lift zones. And currently we have 26 active lift zones 
through BCYF, where we are providing um, advanced Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi on steroids, as we like to call it sometimes, for uh, BCYF community centers. And uh, we've had a, a really um, great partnership with BCYF kicking those off, installing those, and getting those sites up and active. So can you explain to me, it's Comcast is fiber-based or cable-based? Both. 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 And 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 because we got we had some information that very little of your delivery was fiber based. Is that correct or not correct? So we're constantly uh, maintaining, uh, augmenting our our infrastructure, it, and and that's not changing. So we're constantly getting getting further and deeper into the neighborhoods with the fiber. The the coax base you know was already there again, like you mentioned from the cable system. And we're just continuing to build on that, build on that, build on that to make sure that every pocket is served. Again, once in a while, you know, a, a specific address will be raised and brought to our attention because it wasn't initially built out due to its location at the time. And we do whatever we can to make sure that that's happening. And we have we have that happening on, on one street in Roxbury right now, actually, where we're making sure that build gets taken care of. Well, Angel, would you say it was fair to say a, a significant portion of your service is still cable-based? I, I would say that broadband is, is part of our backbone. It, we, serve, we serve broadband as, I mean, as well. It's, it's a major part of uh, who we are as a company. I so know, it's broadband, but broadband based on, it comes from cable or from fiber? I, I would have to look up numbers for you specifically if, if that's what you're looking for. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was curious because the information we got was it was majority cable based, which, as you know, is sort of a little less reliable. It rains, it snows, it winds, it you know does whatever. It's a little well, I think I think the hard wire is still the most reliable form of internet that you can have, you know, because you don't have to be concerned about that, especially if it's you know directly to the home. Um, but, but I can certainly look up where the current bills are going on. I, I know that it's changing all the time. Um, it's a, a fast paced industry for sure. So I would have to look into those numbers for you. And, and in terms of the percentage of the, the city that you serve, do you- We know it's close to hundred. So we, we don't wanna say 97, we don't wanna say 99.9, but we know it's, it's in that range. So at, like, again, access to the sure. infrastructure. You have, you have the ability to serve. Correct, correct. Okay. And that's where, and that's why we partner with BCWF or Age Strong Commission or um, DHA. We partner with a lot of these city agencies to get that word out because the infrastructure is not the issue. It's the affordability and the access that's the issue. Um, and, and we continue to do that with, with all of the communities we serve. But in Boston, those are some of our core partners. Again, BHA, BCYF, Age Strong, uh, and I know, I know I just forgot another one, but um, but we work with them frequently. And, and we're going to start up with uh, the Office uh, for Immigrant Advancement as well. And uh, Verizon? Sure. So just to take a step back, Verizon is a newer provider of um, high-speed broadband service to the city. In 2016, our company entered a partnership with the city um, to invest over $600 million to transfer our network in Boston to an all fiber, 100% fiber optic network that provides Fios high speed internet, um, advanced wireless technology, which also includes 5G, which we're rolling out right now. Boston was one of the first cities in the nation that we rolled that out in. Um, we have so basically where we stand on, on percentage we're building out all of the all of the neighborhoods in Boston we started in our first neighborhoods um, in Nubian Square we were down in Dorchester and also um, the Jamaica Plain High Park area um, and then eventually we moved up through the city um, we have brought our fiber to currently about two thirds to 70% of the city. The last neighborhoods that we're bringing our fiber to over the next couple of years will be, um, are actually Beacon Hill, downtown. We're in the North End right now. We're trying to finish that up, hopefully, um, 
you know, in the next couple of months. Um, so you're really looking at like the Bowdoin Square area, the heart of Boston, which obviously is a little more difficult to build because it's, it, well, it's usually the busiest part of the city, um, even though, you know, we've been dealing with, with the pandemic shutdowns and, and less traffic. Um, our, we're also in the process of bringing our service. What's a little bit more challenging is we have to get permission from property owners of large apartment buildings and complexes to be able to bring our fiber into the building because our fiber does go to every single unit and every single household. So we're also in the process of negotiating with property managers. There are sometimes cases where we are denied permission because they don't want the disruption. This last year slowed it down a little bit just because of the pandemic where people weren't comfortable having technicians working in the building, but we're starting to see an uptick where um, we're being welcomed um, into some of these buildings. Okay, why don't we hear from Starry? Thank you, Chairwoman. So as you mentioned earlier, Starry is a relatively new entrant um, to the market in Boston. Um, we are um, a startup uh, wideband hybrid fiber wireless internet service provider, which is really just a mouthful to say that we are a high capacity, low latency fixed wireless provider. So we build our network very differently from both Comcast and Verizon in that our last mile is wireless. Um, and what's important to note about that is that um, the last mile connection is the most expensive portion of the network to build. And with our high capacity fixed wireless technology, we can reduce the cost of passing um, uh, to a hundred times less than fiber to the home. And that's really important in terms of one, our ability to scale and deploy in a market quickly. Um, so we started um, providing service in Boston in late 2018. And today we're passing more than 425,000 households in the Boston area. We are continuing to build our coverage to um, expand to those areas where you noted there are definitely service gaps. Um, in the Southern part of the city is in areas like Mattapan and Dorchester and, Rocks and Roxbury. Um, we are actively building our network there to provide our service and coverage to those communities. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, I think there are a lot of challenges in terms of being a new entrant to the market. And one of those things is building access. Um, there are existing um, agreements that may exist with building providers that um, create exclusivity around whether it's wiring um, or access or marketing or revenue agreements that do create challenges for new competitors, whether it's Verizon or ourselves, to access those large, what we call MDUs, multi-dwelling units. Um, it's something that we encounter in Boston, but also encounter in all the markets we operate in. Um, we, you know, recognize again that uh, the cost of broadband, we have to continue. And I think Angela spoke so eloquently about the fact that um, in our urban centers, when we talk about digital gaps, it's not a lack of access that drives the digital gap, but it's really a lack of affordability. And from our standpoint, um, that lack of affordability is driven in, in two ways. One, just sheer cost, but two, other hurdles for folks to adopt low cost affordability plans. Things like credit checks or other application processes can really create insurmountable hurdles for households to adopt even low cost um, broadband plans. And so that's something that we tried to innovate on with our Starry Connect program, which is a direct partnership program with public and affordable housing owners to really specific target, to specifically target those communities. Um, that we know are underconnected. Um, so that's a little bit about Starry. We're continuing to grow our footprint. Um, we're you know, happy to serve what we call our hometown. That's where we're headquartered with all of our engineers and R&D. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here at the hearing tonight. I appreciate that. I'm just gonna ask two more questions and then turn it over to the rest of my colleagues here, which is you mentioned exclusivity agreements. Could you expand on that for a minute? There are there are places where those exist and what do you mean by that? So um, exclusivity agreements are agreements that are struck between a provider and a building owner. So in 2000, um, the Federal Communications Commission actually had a, um, a proceeding called competitive access to MTEs, multi-tenant environments. And in that order in 2001, they actually struck the use of exclusive service agreements, which meant that um, a, a, an MVPD, and this, and this is going to go back to all the all the acronyms from like the, the Telecommunications Act, a multi-video channel um, provider, which 
again, a broadband or a broadband provider could not strike an exclusive service agreement um, with the building, which would, which would essentially prohibit competition um, in that building. They struck exclusive service agreements. However, they allowed that exclusive marketing or, exclu or exclusive wiring or exclusive revenue agreements could um, continue to go forward. And what that meant is that a building owner could work with a, pro a provider and say, hey, I'll let you have access to my community and my residents, but let's you know figure out a, a deal to make that happen. Whether you know you pull a wire in and fund it, and then I'll lease it back, or we'll provide you with an ex or you'll provide me with an exclusive revenue stream for every resident that signs up for your service. I'll get a certain percentage, or I'll say I'll allow you to come into my building and I'll provide you exclusive marketing rights so that you solely can communicate to my residents about the services you provide. Um, those agreements are now again under scrutiny by the FCC. They, um, under the last administration, they um, issued another public notice for comment to better understand the impact of these other types of exclusive agreements and whether or not they affect competition in the MDU environment. Um, so that is still on consideration at the FCC. And how common are these agreements? We find that in building, they're more common in buildings of a certain size. So in buildings that have 50 units or more, we typically, um, we encounter these types of agreements probably in 75% or more of all of those types of buildings. And again, it's not something that's just exclusively happening in Boston. It does happen in all the major metro areas as well. Okay. So, uh, uh, I think, and I'm not sure you agree, but we've all experienced it and we've talked about it before you were here, is we believe we have a problem in Boston. We've seen it ourselves. Uh, my favorite sort of story is when the uh, transition team for our new mayor was uh, reporting out to her senior team, the acting mayor to her senior team her chief of policy could not get online. She lives in Dorchester. She got online, but she kept going in and out. That's sort of unacceptable in the 2021. That's a problem. I mean, she has internet, she's like a grown up, and you know, it shouldn't be a problem, but it's pretty embarrassing when you're the chief of policy for the city and you don't have stable internet because you live in Dorchester. Uh, and that's true in Mattapan, it's true in Dorchester. Uh, and no matter what you pay, it's true. It, it, it doesn't matter what you pay, it's just true. And how that happened, we could spend a lot of time talking about how we got here. You know, how, how if you go to the border of Mattapan, you're okay until you cross the border of Mattapan, and then you're not okay. Uh, we could talk a lot, a lot of time about how we got here, but the question is really what can be done about it? And that's where we are today because it is a problem. There are, and it's not in a household, it's outside the household in terms of neighborhoods who either don't have enough begin with outside that, in that neighborhood. There's not enough quality bandwidth in that neighborhood and it is primarily in neighborhoods where there are black and brown and poor people and other people of color. So we need to figure out a solution. And this is not only people who aren't online, it's people who are online. And in some cases paying the same as somebody who has quality internet. They just have unstable, unstable internet. And, and you know, if there's anything that showed that, it was the chief of policy in the city trying to respond <laughs> to the transition team. Um, so I, I, I'm trying to sort of work with you to figure out what you think the solution is. But first I wanna turn this over to my colleagues to have them, uh, ask questions, uh, any, of, any of you who would like to make a comment or ask questions. Yes, Professor Reyes. 
You I th I think uh, my neighbor uh, Robert uh, was first. So. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. No, he's he's deferring to you. Okay. Yes, okay. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much to all of you for being here today, and uh, following the chairwoman's words, I want to talk not about necessarily access, but reliability and uh, advertising. Uh, I will again quote uh, the speed test registered by the I3 Connectivity Explorer platform uh, between a in Boston between April of last year and January of this year showed actual speeds to meet targets of 25 megabytes only 62% of the time, below Massachusetts average, which was uh, according to the same platform, 73% of the time. So my main question today is, is, is going to be, why are Boston residents paying for speeds that providers seem unable to deliver? This puzzles me. Because if a, if a dealer sells me an eight cylinder car, that car must have eight cylinders ready to be used at all the time, at any time. If a company sells me a computer with a particular processor speed, this computer must operate as such at all times and at any time. And if I signed a contract for 100 megabytes with an internet provider. I expect 100 megabytes to be always available to me all the time. But that is not the case. It would seem that some providers might be advertising speeds that they cannot actually provide or they will not actually provide in certain areas. So I have a few questions and I am going to, I'm going to start with, uh, with the first one. I have three questions if you uh, bear with me. Um, a question for the three of you. Do your companies monitor and limit internet traffic to slow activities sometimes in some areas and why? Um, I'll answer for sorry, I'll go first. The answer for us is no. And um, it's very clear in our terms of service with our customers that the only time we would ever um, engage in those types of network management practices is if we see some type of unusual activity um, that is um, potentially um, going to impact um, the broader network or other users. Mm -hmm. um, but as a rule of thumb, we have... Um, and again, this is gonna go into sort of a deeper policy dive, but in 2015, the open internet order was passed by the Federal Communications Commission. And then shortly thereafter was reversed by the previous administration. We made a business decision as a company to adhere to and bake into our terms of service, um, our commitment to that 2015 open internet order, which included um, no throttling um, and, and none of the things that you describe in terms of slowing down people's service or acting as some type of gatekeeper to information that people would want online. Um, so that is, you know, not just lip service. We actually, it, it's in the fine print that we have folks sign and it's a part of our agreement and our um, promise to our customers. Thank you. Well, I'm going to thank uh, Virginia for paving the way. <laughs> um, similarly, that's that's not a practice we engage in. We do not throttle, we do not block, we do not manage, we do not, you know, enhance traffic in one neighborhood and slow it down in another. What I, what I can say that may be helpful um, the city of Cambridge also just published their digital equity study after um, I think about a year and a half of gathering data. And part of that was speed tests. So it's difficult to answer some of these questions um, exactly because I don't know how these speed tests were conducted or what data was used. But if you look at Cambridge's digital, digital equity study, they, they selected a random sampling of uh, customers that were having issues and found, I think in every single case, it was an issue on the user end. Um, 
And the only way you can know that is by knowing exactly what type of modem the user has, exactly what type of speed they've signed up for. Sometimes a customer will sign up for a higher speed because they think their internet is glitchy, but the modem that they're using has a, a limit on it, on the, the speed that it will even allow through. So no matter how high you're paying for it, your modem's not gonna allow your speed to go that high. I would encourage you to take a look at the Cambridge Digital Equity Study. It's fair warning, it's, it's 290 pages, but um, I, I think you may find that I helpful. read everything, don't worry about it. <laughs> And um, just to piggyback on um, the, the other's testimony, Verizon also does not um, throttle, block, manage, or slow down traffic. But um, also, as far as our speeds, we um, because we have an all fiber network um, for our Fios internet, um, every customer has a dedicated line that goes right to their unit or their, their house. Um, onto an ONT or a, a terminal right on the box. And the speeds are, our minimum speeds are um, that we offer a 200 meg upload, um, 200 meg download. So um, it's very, very fast. And those speeds um, are honored. Um, they should be consistent unless there's some sort of equipment or user error. But in those cases, then if they give us a call, we'll test it and um, hopefully help the customer figure it out but um, they get what they pay for. Mm. Uh, thank you very much. So um, a follow-up question. So if you, in, if there is no limits in, in uh, the speed that you provide once uh, somebody has a contract with you, why is it that some providers don't advertise the speed like eight cylinders, but up to, 100 megabytes, up to 25 megabytes, up to. When I read up to as a consumer, what, I'm, what, I, what I understand is like, it's not gonna be always. It's sometimes I'm gonna get 25. Is that, am I understanding correctly, correctly that, uh, that when, when a company advertises a, a, a speed of up to 100 uh, megabytes, uh, it means that it's not going to be constant. Uh, Commissioner, I can respond um, on behalf of Starry. So um, I don't want to blame the lawyers, but <laughs> um, but I'm but I'm going to blame the lawyers here. But I will say I will say this about Starry and our network specifically. Um, so we publish every quarter on our website what our average um, network um, performance is. Um, across our entire performance for both upload as well as download as well as latency. Um, we have built into the app that we provide all of our customers um, speed tests so they can actually test and tell us if they're experiencing some type of issue. We include the up to language um, because our lawyers tell us to include the up to language um, because unfortunately we live in a very litigious society. Um, however, the, we 100% stand by um, the performance that we advertise and deliver to, um, to our customers. Um, I think it's totally apparent in our NPS score in terms of um, how uh, customers view um, our service and what we deliver to them, but we really do strive to be as transparent as possible um, with all of our customers. And um, just to take it back to the technology, as I mentioned, we are um, a, a, a unique, uniquely different technology um, from the uh, other providers on the call today. But what makes us even more unique is that we actually built and developed our entire technology stack from our base stations to the antenna receivers to the actual Wi-Fi hub that goes in a customer's yeah. home so that we can have real transparency down to the actual CP in the home and really understand what types of connectivity issues a particular subscriber might be having. And we did that for a very specific reason because we knew that the, the area that had the most friction for customers was Wi-Fi in the home. And it goes back to a lot of the things that Angela talked about. It was outdated equipment, modems, things that, um, you know, if you had a really old router that was like 802.11n, 
like that might not communicate with some of your newer IoT devices and it could not provide you the same throughput that a Wi-Fi 6 and 802.11ax device today does that can really provide you um, the benefit of all that capacity that's coming into your home. And so um, we designed our technology to really address that friction that happens in the home where the customer gets very frustrated because they don't they don't know what's happening, why devices aren't connecting or why some devices are underperforming related to others. Um, the other thing I'll say is that in our network, we build a 10 to one oversubscription rate, which is very conservative in terms of managing our network and ensuring that every household gets the bandwidth that we have committed to them. Um, I know that uh, other services have other levels of oversubscription rates. And so, you know, and again, that's a choice that folks make in terms of how they manage their network. Um, you know, but to your point, like if you look at New York State in particular, a few years ago, they actually sued Charter Communications around the same issue of under delivery on advertised speeds. And um, that was something that they settled, I want to say was about three or four years ago. But that really um, kind of goes to the heart of the concern that you're raising here. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question for the group, I guess. Yeah. Um, I'm concerned about Harris. So we know there's uh, there are three lawyers in the room, four actually. So, but we have one judge, real judge. So Judge Harris. Um, okay, I, I'm sorry. I won't blame the lawyers too much then. <laughs> I'm um, when they're doing buildings in Boston now. They do linkage, where they provide a percentage of the cost of the building in order to help organizations that work with lower income people in the city. Do the telecommunication companies do anything similar? Um, for those folks who cannot afford um, to have the speeds and the modems that are necessary in this world, um, do you do anything to help those folks? Sorry, I'll, I'll speak up, but I, I don't want to. <laughs> To over yeah, but um, but uh, yes, Commissioner. So we in late 2018 launched a program called Starry Connect, and it's a specialized partnership program with public and affordable housing communities where we provide a 30 megabit symmetrical product um, for $15 a month. All equipment included, no data caps, no long-term contracts, but most importantly, we don't require credit checks or the household to be eligible for any other federal assistance or other um, support programs. Um, we launched that in 2018 because we saw a very specific need within public and affordable housing to get high speed, low cost connectivity out to these families. Um, we have since launched um, that program to more than 30,000 units of public and affordable housing um, in our five markets that we serve. And that includes 3,200 units of public and affordable housing in the Boston metro area alone. So we work with folks like the Boston Housing Authority, um, the neighborhood developers, um, uh, Shocket companies, Beacon Communities, um, and, uh, and folks like the Alston Brighton CD, uh, Community Development Corporation um, to provide this ultra low cost option to their community. Um, during the pandemic last year, and I, I'm, we're not alone in this, Comcast and Verizon also signed the Keeping Americans Connected Pledge, where all of us committed to not discontinue service to any household due to non-payment related to COVID-19. Um, Starry took that commitment a step further by extending our commitment through the end of July, as well as making our Connect program free to all of our subscribers. And then in August, we kicked off our Fresh Start initiative, which forgave the debt of any subscriber um, that had owed us money during the pandemic. Um, so we have taken a lot of steps to support um, our communities that we know um, have been most vulnerable and even more so during the pandemic. Um, and we're committed to continuing to expand our program and the work of our Connect, um, the work that our Connect program does to enable connectivity, but also partnerships like the ones we have with Microsoft and PCs for People for low cost access to devices as well. Well, my concern is the term low cost. Um, I know $15 don't mean much to a lot of folks, but with some of the folks that I've worked with and around, that's, they just don't have it. Are there any options for those people? 
So there are a number of different options. As the chairwoman mentioned, the Federal Communications Commission on May 12th kicked off the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program, um, which provides up to a $50 credit per month for eligible households to, pro, um, to put towards broadband access. Um, Starry, as well as, and sorry, I don't mean to be I'm not speaking on behalf of Comcast and Verizon, but Starry, Comcast and Verizon are all eligible participating providers in this program um, that will allow families who cannot afford the cost of broadband um, the ability to. Um, the FCC also kicked off their emergency connectivity fund, which is a $7 billion fund that allows schools and libraries to access that funding to get targeted support for broadband access and devices to households that are also struggling um, to, uh, to, to meet that need. Um, we all know that Lifeline um, is also available as a benefit towards broadband. We also know that there are a lot of problems with the Lifeline program in terms of adoption and getting folks to sign up. So my hope is that um, with all this focus at the federal level and the state and local level at looking at support programs for, for especially vulnerable households that we'll take another look at Lifeline and how that program is run and how we can lower barriers for folks to participate, for more folks to participate in receiving their Lifeline benefit. Sure, Commissioner. I'm sorry. Uh, that this new federal program, uh, Judge, applies even to people who do not have internet now, uh, $50 right. a month. Now, what a lot of us lobbied for, including the city of Boston and Chicago and Los Angeles, was that uh, the cities and organizations like Tech Goes Home and others who provide technical assistance and learning and devices to low-income people that they could apply on behalf of low-income people for this money. And actually people lobbied against that. So the money goes to the providers, directly to the providers. So it's not a benefit from the providers, it's actually a benefit to the providers because they get the $50 and they don't have to do anything for it and the, the low income people have to apply for it. So what we were arguing for was that the organizations who support low income people could apply for it. Uh, which, and, and you know, we get into the fact which would some will get into anyway is the advertising, the outreach, multiple languages, all of that you know, really doesn't exist now. And, uh, and it's a problem. The people you want to reach, right? Are the people we're not reaching is, is a problem. <laughs> but Robert, you were waiting to ask uh, a question. Sorry. Yes. Uh, I just, uh, 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 the representative of Comcast and Verizon didn't have a chance to answer my question of speeds up to. And uh, I, I would like to hear that I understand that, um, or I imagine they're gonna they're gonna tell me that is the, the that, that is not the provider's fault. That is the the computer or the modem. Um, but uh, I think there is evidence. Uh, it's out there in the world that uh, actually those speeds that are advertised are only good at the modem. Uh, something the consumers don't know. Um, but I would like to underline why I am doing this and why I'm being so serious and a little bit aggressive with these questions. I just finished teaching uh, a whole year online at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. I don't want, I, I, I don't think you can even imagine what my students and I went through. I am a subscriber uh, to one of your companies and um, I kept, I have the highest uh, level uh, that they offer. I live in Dorchester Center, high poverty, working class, minority neighborhood. And I constantly dropped. And my students constantly dropped. And this is in spite of having excellent technology from my university excellent contract from my provider. Um, so I do not believe it is only the device. Um, I think it's, 
it's okay to blame the lawyers. I'm not a lawyer, so I'm gonna let you blame the lawyers, but there is something behind that advertising that I saw in motion uh, this past year, and I think it's unfair. It might be unjust, although it's probably legal, but not everything that is legal is right. So uh, with that said, if, if, if you don't mind, please Verizon and Comcast, um, give me your answers. Just to add to that, if you are a customer of Comcast or Verizon, you have a Comcast or Verizon modem. You're saying no. I, I mean, it's it, optional. That's all. That's all. It's it's not required. That's all. You have a Comcast. You mean you can have a Comcast customer who has a different modem than Comcast? Yes. What percent of Comcast customers do not have Comcast modems? I, I have not a clue. <laughs> I, I, I have never heard of one ever anywhere. I don't so know. Read about it in the Cambridge Digital and Equity Center. And in fact, you just sent out new modems to everybody who has an, an, a modem within the last two years. You just sent them. And I'll tell you, to put in the new modem took my son, who's a techie, two hours on the phone with your people who couldn't answer the questions. So uh, if that's, I know you have to, and you had to have a Comcast modem to okay. upgrade to be the right speed that I have. So I'd love to know how many people don't have a Comcast modem. <laughs> I, I don't have that answer. Yeah, but for you to blame it on the modem. I'm not, I, I'm saying that's a possibility. Well, the possibility has to be very small. So I would, I would suggest you don't use that as an excuse because that has to be a very, very small percentage of your customers who use a modem that you do not supply. And, mm -hmm. and so you want to answer the professor's question, but I also want Robert is next in line. So, but to go around and say it's somebody's modem, you know, when you supply the modems is really. I'll, I'll just, I'll, again, I encourage you to read the digital equity study that the city put out, city of Cambridge. Mm -hmm. It's helpful. It speaks to I that issue. I have actually talked to the people in Cambridge. But, okay. It's, it's in the study. <laughs> yeah. I recommend you read it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So do you want to answer the professor's question? Anybody? I mean, I heard this. I, I, I'll answer. I just didn't want to um, have the answer when oh, I talked okay. about so, so um, our our network, um, we do um, stand by the speeds that we advertise. Yes, there can be exceptions to it, but our entry level FiOS internet product starts at um, twenty megabits per second. Excuse me, two hundred megabits per second, and we have other plans that have even more broadband that, you know, you pay for it, but if you need the capacity because you have multiple family members or, or um, doing a lot of um, streaming or as you put it, um, online learning, the 200 should be more than enough for a family. However, some people want more and um, they, can, they can go increase their plans accordingly. I'm sorry, Thank may you. I? Thank you. I apologize. May I just make one one quick note, just as in with regards to speeds. I think that um, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about um, download and upload speeds and why those are important. Um, I know that you know in in advertising, often you know folks they they focus more on the download speeds because really, um, when we were th talking about like you know maybe go back a few years ago, you know downloading a music file or a movie. Um, or streaming something was really important and having that speed, um, particularly when video compression wasn't where it's at today, was important having that capacity and having that speed. But today when we're talking about a world where um, we need a lot of upload capacity to do exactly what we're doing tonight, which is having a video call that requires both downloading and uploading of data, um, that upload speed is really uh, what's important. And that's why, you know, from our perspective, when we talk to customers, we really focus not just on the download, but really on the upload capacity, because that can really determine what your experience is going to be as a customer um, and what your experience is going to be when you are um, trying to learn online or work from home or do anything outside of just downloading um, a file. So I just wanted to kind of um, 
put that out there that, you know, when we talk about speeds, um, we, we definitely need to talk about both, both sides of that. Robin. Hi, thank you. And this is actually a perfect segue uh, to when we're bringing up modems. One of the issues I've had over the years and myself and friends is a lot of, let's say, lack of locations to access new equipment to drop things off or to exchange. Question of finding a location uh, to get a new modem. Um, the locations are hard to get to oftentimes. They're not on public transit. And for um, since the city of Boston is so dense with both, I'm going to mainly focus on Verizon and Comcast, clearly. They're very densely populated locations, but there's very um, hard to reach physical spots to train to turn equipment in. Furthermore, um, certain providers, it appears that their storefronts that they maintain are understaffed, haven't been cleaned, cleaned or updated in years, um, where the one up in this corner where I was dropping off equipment with a friend a few months ago, it was in bad shape. Um, and I had to drive to Stoughton myself. I think it was Stoughton, uh, Willard's Corner, I think it's called. It's a, it's a, some type of shopping mall. Um, but I had to drive all the way out there to swap out um, equipment. So I do think there's an issue about just how, where and how um, your corporations are, are keeping the physical storefronts to change products. Um, and I know sometimes it seems like some people are mailing things out. I've had uh, neighbors who have some challenges accessing a post office to mail something back. So I was wondering if you could just talk about how you guys lo or your companies locate uh, the storefronts and such that gives physical support, since that's a clear barrier for a lot of people. Since we are bringing up the modem issue, um, it sounds like some modems have had issues more than others. And that's a whole swath of people that need to swap them out. So I'm interested about your access and how you guys locate and update your storefronts and staff them so they're appropriately staffed. Thank you. Um, I'll just chime in and say, so our, our store locations, and, and we have a number of partners that we work with, including UPS and 7-Eleven and different locations that you can do various functions with. Um, but our store locations, our full service store locations, are um, governed by the license that we sign with the city of Boston. So that's um, a document that we sign every 10 years. We're, we're actually wrapping another one up right now. Um, and in the license, it, we, you know, we negotiate the number of stores and uh, the fact that they will be geographically dispersed so as to make sure that all corners of the city have access. So we have, we have seven stores in the city of Boston. And that is a requirement of the license. I'm sorry, just to clarify, the seven stores, is there, a, is, uh, are they your stores or are they subcontracted out who'd be responsible for maintenance and staffing and such? Sometimes, it, you know, that there will be other staff there, but if it says Xfinity on the front, that's part of our license obligation. In terms of other services that you can, uh, you can execute the payment, but not. You can do that at our partners, which are 7-Elevens and the US UPS stores. Okay, thank you. But we staff. Are they in, in, in neighborhoods distributed in? Yes. In like Dorchester and Mattapan? We just opened up a brand new one in Roxbury and we have one uh, in Dorchester. I can I can send you the list. Again, it's, it's part of these license terms. Appreciate that. Can, can you tell me, uh, do you provision all neighborhoods with equal bandwidth per customer? Uh, I'll, again, I'll speak. Our infrastructure is the same throughout the city. So Nothing changes. How, how do you explain why the professor... I, I don't know. I, I, I'm happy to... If, if you'd like to reach out to me and we can and look into, if you're one of our customers even, and, and we can look into that and see what the issue or was, but I can't tell you without knowing the, the issue. City, or, I mean, they're both in Dorchester. 
or everybody I've ever talked to in Dorchester has this problem. The former chief of policy for the city, who Joyce Lenahan, who lives in the city. Yes, I know her. The former, the now chief of policy who lives in Dorchester has the same problem. Everybody, you know, it's, it, Dorchester seems to be a problem, as does Mattapan seem to be a problem. And they're, you know, this isn't a happenstance. It's, it's an issue. It's not a made up issue, it's an issue. And, and we heard during the hearings, uh, a continual uh, uh, issue, like the woman I talked to that we heard from who lived in Mattapan uh, and one who lived in Dorchester seniors, uh, they were continually talking about being dropped the dropping issue in Mattapin and Dorchester. We didn't hear people from the Back Bay complaining about, or Beacon Hill complaining about uh, services being interrupted. We continually heard from people from Mattapin in Dorchester, continually. Send them to me because, because our infrastructure is the same in every corner of the city. But why do you think that is? I don't have the answer. And is this right something I don't know anything about uh, the service issues that are that are being that they're experiencing. Um, but if if you'd like to reach out and tell me more, um, I'm happy to look into it. And the maps that have you, we will send you the maps that we have, right? The maps that we showed you tonight, and what I've, it will show you is, uh, you know, both the lack of access uh, and uh, we will also show you the, some of the things about speed. Yes. Excuse me, Margaret, just to clarify the, the maps are based on ACS data, correct? Yes. Okay, so we use ACS data too to identify populations that haven't signed up for internet yeah. essentials so we can target our outreach. Yeah. So just to be clear, those maps identify where service has not been adopted as to where there is not infrastructure. Right, Again, right. we have infrastructure in almost 100% of the city. Right, right, So right. those folks there There's two different have issues. Right. access. Right, those are two different issues. One is access, mm -hmm. and the other is reliable provision of service. So we're talking about two different things here. And I, at the moment I was talking about reliable provision right. of service, which is what we, continually heard about in terms of uh, at the hearings. And, and the other thing is, is um, the, in, in terms of service, uh, Angela, one of the things you said, we don't hear it. And one of the things we heard during all the hearings was when people call, they have problems with uh, petitioning with uh, basics, uh, what they call the essentials, Comcast essentials or uh, internet essentials. Internet essentials is there's a number to call. Uh, mm -hmm. Often find that the person at the end of the number can't answer the questions and language. We said how do, how can we make this better? We said tonight how can we make this better? Sure. Is, is, so is, is having people speak multiple languages and having so, anyone answering the phone be able to answer the questions uh, rather than having a, a lot of people answer it who don't know the answers? Because I think then you would hear probably more of these issues if people were multilingual who were calling problem. One of the things we're going to provide is on web, our website, we will now put up a form for people to, who have the internet to, in fact, inform us of problems they are having with the internet. Of course, they have to have the internet to do that. But the kinds of things we heard during these hearings with continually being dropped, we will capture that information uh, and provide you with it. So it's not anecdotal. Well, it will still be anecdotal because we'll be hearing it. But I will tell you that uh, in terms of what we think would be helpful was the issues around language in terms of outreach, uh, 
making everything as clear as you possibly can in terms of providing video uh, and simple, simple one page sort of directions in multiple languages uh, and uh, a helpful video about how to do things. Uh, we're talking about people who come from different cultures and speak different languages. Uh, I, I personally find things uh, complicated to do when I get them from you guys. Uh, and I have some education behind me and I have some technical abilities. I think they're pretty complicated. Uh, I, I heard the starry people talk about the ID. I think having uh, uh, the, the that provides a barrier for some B, the ID requirements. It also makes people nervous. Uh, I think that's a barrier uh, to people. Uh, I also think I've heard a number of people, Verizon and Comcast in particular, uh, I heard during the Michael Lynch hearing, uh, and I hear on television all the time, the amount of money that Verizon and Comcast in particular, I think Starry too, but I know less about Starry, are providing in terms of contributions to local organizations. And one thing I would say and suggest is if you are going to make financial contributions to 5013Cs in our area, you do it to organizations that are providing devices and technical assistance and training to folks so that they can access and learn how to use the internet. Because that's, that's what we're interested in. That is, that is a basic need for life these days. And instead of providing, you know, money for, I don't know what you're providing for to no. do other things, but I would say, you know, the people like Tech Goes Home and other people, if working together in partnerships would be a wonderful thing to do in terms of the kinds of barriers that I think you are interested in breaking down. We are interested in working with you to break down. Uh, those kinds of uh, supports would make a huge difference, I think. Uh, so I can cover do that. I can cover a couple of those questions for you, Margaret. Um, most recent, the you let's start with the last one around supporting nonprofit organizations, and you brought up Tech Goes Home, where our original pilot was launched in 2010 with Open Air Boston, which is what became Tech Goes Home. We are still a significant supporter of Tech Goes Home today. Quite frankly, I am working on a number of different initiatives with them right now. Um, so understand that digital equity is absolutely where we make our philanthropic investments and we have for quite some time. You asked about languages. Um, we just released um, EBB language, EBB information in 15 different languages. Our internet essentials material is available in all of those languages as well. Our mobile phone application is available in seven languages. Folks can call into our Internet Essentials call center. We answer the phone in English and Spanish. If they push nine, they have access to a specific language line. Those agents answer are able to speak on average six different languages. And if they do not understand the language that they are being addressed in, they will connect to language line, which again enables access in another 250 languages. Sometimes it is not as smooth as we would like it to be, but we can all speak 250 languages at one time. I do, don't you? <laughs> Commissioner, Anne, Anne, you had a question. I'm sorry, did I interrupt yes. that? Thank you, Chairwoman. Commissioner I wanted to ask, I, I heard from Starry how they had a, a debt forgiveness program. Yeah. And I was wondering what Comcast and Verizon did. Um, did. Did you forgive debt for people that were having trouble during low income people that were having trouble during the pandemic? For access to internet essentials, we are waiving all bad debt currently. And Verizon, what we did is we worked with each individual customer. We rolled them into payment plans. We also didn't charge fees or disconnect during um, the worst of the pandemic. And after that, we put them on payment plans and we work with individual customers to resolve their issues um, so that we don't disconnect customers during this time and help them pay their bills. And so since the internet, 
so I, I sorry, Virginia, I heard you mention that you did in August, you forgave people's debt. We did. I just wanted to clarify that it was across all of our subscribers. So it was not only um, it, it was not only for our Starry Connect subscribers, which we had made free during that period, but it was across our entire subscriber base. So anyone who had um, owed us money during that time period, we forgave their debt in August. Thank you. Yes, Professor. Uh -huh. So um, I want to acknowledge that you all uh, work for companies that are for profit and that you made an enormous investment before you even began making money. So I understand that the, uh, the access we have to internet is, is through the investment of your company and its investors. And I wanna offer some uh, suggestions that would uh, maybe uh, improve um, the perception among the public uh, that internet companies are, uh, are not very clear on their advertising. I think there could be um, more clarity in the terms of the contracts in general, but specifically, I would like to um, suggest clear language regarding limits on contracted speed due to throttling. You all said you don't, um, you don't uh, use this practice. In that case, a statement saying we do not limit uh, speed would be very important. Uh, although I understand that lawyers, your lawyers might not like it, but if it is true, I would do it. I would certainly go with a company that does that. Also, limits on contracted speeds due to other factors. For instance, if the speed that you say it's up to 100 is only accurate at the modem, if that is clearly stated in the contract and prominently stated in the contract, then it's up to me to go with one company or with another. If the company said this is this is good through all devices, as long as you have the right modem, I'll go with that company. Uh, so those are my two suggestions. Um, good suggestions. I, I just wanted to um, respond, Commissioner. Thank you for that. And we 100% agree. Um, we have in plain language our commitments around um, our network management practices and net neutrality, as well as um, how we manage our network. In addition to that, we have in consumer friendly, plain language, our commitments to customer privacy as well. And I know that that, again, that's another sort of um, important consumer facing um, issue. Um, in 2019, um, California passed the California Consumer Privacy Act. Act. Um, we made the decision at that time, um, because we also do have uh, subscribers and our network in California, to take the CCPA and apply it across all of our subscribers, including those living um, in Boston, um, so that they could benefit from uh, the protections under CCPA, which um, today continues to stand as the most stringent um, Consumer Privacy Act um, in the country. Um, so I 100% agree, all of that should be in plain language, easy to find on websites, and that's something that we've committed to. And if you go to our website today, it's super easy to find. The lawyers must not like you at all. Uh, Sorry, I have gone to your website, but you are not in Dorchester. Yeah, we, we are not, not yet in Dorchester. We are actively um, trying to build our network and expand it to Dorchester. We do have, we're starting our footprint in Mattapan and working our way. So yes, we're, we're coming. Let me see if we can open our questions to the audience, uh, Suze. Oh, Robert, while we're opening our questions to the audience, we ask people to put their questions in the chat uh, or uh, raise your hand. And Robert, while we're doing that, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I just want to give uh, Verizon uh, an opportunity to answer my earlier question about yep. their storefront, uh, how they um, house or their, the way in which they locate their um, storefronts for the, where people exchange equipment throughout the city so it's accessible. Just like to kind of hash that out since Comcast says they've committed to seven stores in a contract. I'm wondering if Verizon has something similar. 
So Verizon does also have a fr um, franchise agreement to offer um, cable TV in the city of Boston. And we do have a couple of um, store locations through authorized dealers where you can return or get Fios equipment in South Boston and on Boylston Street are two of the locations. Um, a lot of our activity is done also via um, the mail where if you do need a new router or something we can get it right out within a day there is a lot um, a lot more especially in the last year or so that's been happening via via the mail but um that is the preferred model and we um commit to get things out quickly so it's convenient for people so the issue where you have to get to a post office drop it is what you're bringing up it, although there are a couple of store locations to physical locations I, that's that's part of my challenge is there was uh, two locations when I, and I had to go drive out to the suburbs because there was both a access issue and a supply issue of what the store had on hand and I was just surprised first a company that had such a very large footprint that uh, there's very few opportunities especially in uh, low income non white communities. Um, I just I found that kind of uh, interesting I think I want to just highlight and the con condition of some of the stores, less so for Verizon, but just want to put that out there. Thank you. So are there, uh, Susan, do we have any? Uh, no. No questions from the, so far. Okay. So we'll give people a couple of minutes if they do have questions. So what, I, what I'm hearing uh, from Robert for the Verizon people is the, 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 the only, and I guess I heard there's a, one in South Boston and one on Boylston Street, which is where I live, right up the street. There's a Verizon store, uh, but none in uh, in in the Mattapan, Dorchester, or those areas. Uh, and and there aren't many post offices anymore. Is the problem? Uh, they're just on. They they've disappeared, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, and if you don't have a car. Um, it's a problem to, to take a package as opposed to an envelope, but a package to take somewhere. So it might be something you take back to your folks and suggest that this is something that might be an issue um, in terms of maybe there are some ways to uh, like like uh, Amazon does, you know, to have places that you could drop things off that are not a, a Verizon store or not a post office. Uh, in areas that are uh, lower income neighborhoods, you might think of that are uh, people don't have transportation uh, to go to what Robert did was go off to a, a suburb. Uh, you might think about that because now that you're, that you're mailing modems or pieces of equipment uh, to people uh, that you can't put it in a mailbox to return something that will become an issue for people as post offices continue to disappear from us. So uh, people have any other questions? Uh, we, will, we will provide you with this, all of the slides, uh, PowerPoints that we have tonight and any other information that we have. We also will continue to provide you with uh, information that we develop from our own website and information that we have spoken about. Our concern is that in Mattapan and Dorchester, we believe that uh, there is a problem from what we've heard uh, and what we've seen in terms of uh, speed and reliability. Uh, and we've done some testing uh, and we do not believe it has to do with a modem. We believe it has to do with the provisioning in those neighborhoods. And we will turn that data over to you. Uh, and hopefully we will find a solution together uh, to provide more reliable broadband to areas that we're concerned with. And those neighborhoods are low income neighborhoods and they are neighborhoods with uh, particularly black and brown people and other people of color. And I know you would be as concerned as we are with ensuring that those neighborhoods are treated uh, equally as well as Back Bay and Beacon Hill. So we, we appreciate your joining us tonight. 
we appreciate your working with us on the solution to what we think is a challenging issue. And I know that that you, if you if you uh, saw this data, or if if this data exists in a way that that you uh, uh, see as reliable, that you would work to solve this problem as we would. So I appreciate uh, uh, your joining us this evening, and uh, uh, we have allowed, I think, time for members of the public to have an opportunity, Susan, right, to provide questions or uh, raise questions in the chat or push nine to raise your hand. And we haven't seen anybody, though we do have a number of people in our audience. They're all shy this evening or we've, we've taken up all their time. Um, so if there is, I appreciate all of the uh, time and uh, effort of my colleagues. Uh, and I definitely appreciate uh, all of the providers coming and, and we may have been difficult on you, but we're all on the same uh, uh, page here. We're trying to provide the best services to our uh, citizens of Boston. And you will see have joined us is uh, several of our colleagues from UMass Boston who have worked on the data that you've seen in our PowerPoints tonight and we appreciate them. Uh, you see them on the screen now, uh, and we thank you as well. And I will uh, 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 see if someone has a motion to adjourn. I'll make so, said motion. Is there a second? I'll second the motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? The meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.